Hello everyone, this is Remlays from 40k Theories, and welcome to this newest episode of Adeptus Podcasters. Joining me as always is Tactica Imperialis. Hello everyone. And joining us as our guest this week, uh, a returning guest who hasn't been on for quite a while, but you will recognise her talents from various pieces of artwork she's done for both myself, and for TTS, and for other channels besides. Ladies and gentlemen, our guest at this time is Adeptus Adamaris. Hello. I have been dug out from the hole I've been in. <laughs> yes, it's, it's been a while since we heard from you. You've been very quiet, but we hope everything's all right. Oh, yeah. I think it's just really I just kind of focused on personal things. Uh, More than Like fair. stuff. Yeah. Mm. yeah. What was the last episode you were on? I'm racking my brain. Like I think you were on 100, but I can't think other than that. Uh, the last one, I think, was... Uh, it had to do with Slanesh, I think. I think it was the 69th one. Oh, blimey. It's going back that far. <laughs> At least I remember the, the Slanesh stuff coming yeah. out. That's been over a year. Yeah, blimey heck. I mean, it feels like a decade, but that's more because of COVID. <laughs> I mean, we've been doing this for half a decade nearly, so yeah, oh, I can goodness. understand that sentiment too. Uh, just looking back, uh, yeah, you were last on episode 108. Oh, Right. Yeah. Quite a while ago. <laughs> Which is also a while ago. <laughs> yes. Yes, this is 145 for those who are keeping track. I know it says oh it in the title goodness. and in the picture and all that, but you know. So, in the news this week, let's talk about the big thing, or the little thing that's also a big thing in its own right. The return of the Squats as a tabletop army. Yes, April Fool's gone wrong. Or gone very right, depending on how you Very view it. right. A, a glorious double bluff. Or you could say... Huh? I was, at, I was at work, and I was just scrolling my feed on my lunch break, and I saw that, uh, this thing about a trailer for a new faction, and I clocked and went, hang on, wait, that's, that's squats. Wait, hang on, they're doing squats? And I hadn't actually clocked it was April the 1st until I got home, and I genuinely didn't think about it. And then two days later, it was like, oh, no, actually, we're doing squats. Yes. Or as the army itself is becoming known as... The Leagues of Votan. Yeah. Um, they have published a, a separate article uh, about the law of the squats and how they, how we've got here, talking about space dwarves and all their time in Epic and how they got written out of the law. Um, and it does make it clear um, they are still called squats, so they're not completely retconning it. Um it's more a case of like squat. It's like an in-universe slur against them. Indeed. Kind of thing. Yeah, absolutely. Because they refer to themselves now as the kin, and the leagues of Votan basically being well, I assume Votan's their territory. Because in old law, the squat leagues were basically they're your equivalent of Imperial Guard regiments or Space Marine chapters in terms of factions and stuff like that. So, right, makes sense. Because yeah, like the League of Grendel, for example. So the leagues, plural, Votan. I assume that's basically the squat leagues around the Votan region or something. I don't know. Possibly. I guess Votan anyway. I think pretty much meme magic is definitely real. It has been back, brought forever. <laughs> all we need now is the Plastic Thunderhawk. Indeed. That, is that all the clocks now, apart from Plastic Thunderhawk stopped? That'll be all the clocks, yeah. <laughs> I mean, technically they have done a Plastic Thunderhawk for Aeronautica, but nobody counts that. What? No, no, one can. it's not the right size, is it? I don't think. No, exactly. No. It's like it's like the one for Aeronautica is like, but you know, the size of a fun size Snickers bar. <laughs> it's about the size of an actual squat. Hey. Bad joke. Um, but there is some interesting lore. Now, I'm going to be honest. I've never read up on the squats past a cursive read for a video on abhumans. So I know next to nothing about squats. Um, I understand the hype for them, and I understand their legacy, but. I've never read up on them. So something that's in this article was quite interesting that the leagues may are uh, essentially power to trade with the Imperium on an even footing and were not allowed to be executed by commissars and had tech priests sent to study with them, but they're not an Imperial faction. They try to make that quite clear that they are not an Imperial faction. And they have psychers, which is... Um, the first dwarf faction I can think of. I know it's technically not dwarves, but you know what I mean. Uh, yeah, space dwarves, same thing. Th that's yeah. pretty much it. There's especially like back then when they were having it more emphasized as being like space fantasy. So you know you had your elves, you had your orcs, and then of course you had your dwarves. I I remember, I remember people talking about the Skaven though. There was like a, gosh, they almost were like steampunk. 
will they come back? I hope one day. But that's just because I like ratty boys. So that's just me. Yeah. Didn't people used to think the Hrud was sort of the analogue for Skaven? Yeah, that was based on a um, a piece of art from third edition where you had like um, an alien wearing a cloak, like a hood, like skinless features, but it had a rat-like tail and was holding like what looked like a warp block Giselle. And then the Xenology book came out and said, lol, fuck you, they're blob monsters. <laughs> Aye. But obviously we can't talk about the return of squats without talking about the return of the squat model uh, that they have revealed, the actual miniature that we've seen. It was a nice super advanced bolter. Yeah, Exo Armor, I believe they call it. Um, is it a bolter? You'll forgive me looking at that ammo magazine. It looks more like a melter canister or a flame canister. Sure it was men- I'm pretty sure it was mentioned somewhere that that's actually a bolter. Uh, yeah, it might ju- And how, like, squat technology is actually more advanced than that of the Imperium because they never regressed during, you know, um, the Age of Strife. I would kind of imagine, like, a squat or, like, a dwarf style race also just using, like, slugs anyway i don't know i feel like energy isn't really their thing um they want something yeah. like meaty and heavy yeah in the artwork that accompanies it you've got what looks like a plasma pistol and a power fist um, that's true i was looking more just like at the model itself at least like the main guy they were showing looks kind of i don't know more bulky but i suppose no, yeah. it's just speculation looks more like a typical line trooper yeah yeah i would agree but it, I mean, it could be something like it's like a rotating drum, advanced rotating drum magazine or something. I don't know. Just talk up to Dark Age Tech. <laughs> that would be cool. Yeah. I mean, it is a nice model. I know some people were divided on it when it was revealed because I think some people got in their heads what a squat is supposed to look like. And with models like Grendel Grendelson, they very much played into what the old squats were like. I mean, even in, fair- in fairness, even the squats themselves didn't know what the fuck they looked like, because the law had them being very, you know, stereotypical dwarf and Nordic and Viking-esque, you know, in their uh, decoration, stuff like that. And then the models were having, like, you know, short, fat bikers. You know, <laughs> so it's like, they didn't know what the hell they were doing. <laughs> yeah, this um, is very true. I-, I like the fact that they basically have a human faction that's not, that doesn't have an imperial aesthetic. Is it, yeah, are they um, technically humans though? I thought they were kind of their own thing. Um, what it they're reads a human at, subspecies, basically. Yeah, what the article says um, is just to read a quote. Um, their background positioned them as miners, descendants of human settlers evolved to survive on mineral dense worlds with heavy gravity and diverged into a human subspecies. So they were human, but they're now evolutionarily non-viable. It's kind of like us to Neanderthals, if you kind of follow. Yeah, yeah. No, that makes sense. Neanderthals are still a species of humans. So. Well, so are squats. So. Exactly, yeah. Yeah. But yeah, I think it's a nice design and it wouldn't look out of place. I reckon there's a fair few Caradron Overlords players looking at this and going, ooh, high-tech dwarves. I bet there's a few Caradron players thinking how they could convert these into their sort of <laughs> Endrin suits and uh, for their... Vice versa probably as well. For what, sorry? And vice versa as well. Oh, like, and vice like, versa. I mean, could you imagine, instead of having transports, you just give your squats airships instead. Or balloon, the giant balloons on their back. Or that, yeah. And the Endrin suits are really cool. And the, the big beard armoured, the armoured beard masks that the Caradron use are really cool as well. That is so, really cool. Oh, you mean like for Warhammer Fantasy? Yeah, the AOS guys, um, uh, the Caradron yeah, yeah. overlords. Okay, I'm a little, I'm a little, I haven't really kept up, so... <laughs> No, I think they came fine. out a while ago, but... Uh, yeah, they're from AOS uh, back end of 1st edition, I think. I think. Yeah, I think they're back end of 1st edition Age of Sigmar, the Caradron Overlords. Oh my goodness. I mean, uh, uh, put this way, the, the Caradron, there's one character who literally has a giant uh, balloon on his back and he's got a top hat. That is kind of... That's kind of great, though. I don't know. I like it. <laughs> it's like silly, but also cool. Yeah, they're a really cool faction, the Caradron. And they have steampunk airships with those balloons on top as well. I like it. They're cool. They get my approval. (laughs) Someone's going to take that one particular Caradron and turn into like some kind of squat pimp or something. I don't know. (laughs) Because of the top hat. All he needs is like a little like a fur collar lining that's like white with like some spots on it and like a really gaudy cape. <laughs> and, cha- and change the sword to a cane. It could count as a four-star league. That's your squat living ancestor, Psyker. There you go. 
Oh, it doesn't oh, have dear. to be a pimp. Dear, oh dear, oh dear. <laughs> also, tell me, you know when you, you know when you said um, this is the first uh, dwarf style faction you can think of that had like the kind of like wizards or whatever. Yeah. Do you forget against chaos dwarves? Oh yeah. Sorry, I've, I, it's because chaos dwarves haven't been in Sigma, and like they weren't really given models in fantasy since the Hell Canon. So I hadn't really thought of chaos dwarves because they haven't been redone yet. Well, they do have rules in, in Age of Sigma, though. Uh, Forge World exclusive rules, which are from AOS 1 or AOS 2, so they're incredibly out of date and incredibly bad. I was going to say, like, Sisters of Battle had rules for ages, but only, like, uh, not too long ago did they finally get models. I still need to buy some. And two codices as well. They did. Absolutely. Two Super. codices and two successive editions. 8th edition and ninth edition codices, didn't they? Mm-hmm. Absolutely. That's why it's kind of cool to see all this stuff coming back, because obviously they did really well with the sisters, so now we're like, oh, we'll see how, how it goes with the squads. And I think it's good, because I think people were would have been very sceptical. They're introducing this new faction. How do you introduce a new faction now to 40k? It's not like AOS, where there's huge amounts of empty space that's as yet unexplored. We know what the galaxy looks like. We know who the major players are, where the major players are. Like, for an alien faction to appear out of nowhere that isn't coming from outside the galaxy like the Tyranids, it's quite well, hard. They managed with the Tau. Oh, they managed it, absolutely. But in 3rd edition, the Imperium was what it was, but they had the Necrons basically were buried underground. The Tau evolved out of nowhere. The Tyranids came from outside the galaxy. I don't... They've kind of used a lot of the how do you invent a new species tropes that aren't just resurrecting stuff from the past. Like, for example, doing the Hrud would be a really interesting move as a way to bring back something um, from the past. But I don't know how you'd introduce a new faction that isn't already in pre-existing lore at this stage. I, I'm not saying don't do it. I just don't know how. I think one of the best ways you could probably do it is actually, funnily enough, in Horus Heresy, you need to turn and say, oh, by the way, this is a race that ended up being driven to extinction during the Great Crusade or something. I don't know. <laughs> Then you can justify why I haven't seen it in 40k before. Yeah, something like. Or you can you can always do the do the pull of comes through another dimension. I mean that's some some cool esoteric horror kind of stuff. But I don't know. I'm if getting some Yuzong Vong vibes here. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I would be okay with that. <laughs> we get a 40k Star Wars crossover that we never wanted <laughs> or asked for. I mean, the Yuzong Vong are still cool though. I mean, oh, yeah. I don't really want Star Wars to touch anything I like, but I mean, just say. <laughs> <laughs> oh, don't, don't worry. Disney made anything you liked about Star Wars non canon anyway, so. <laughs> that is true. Does that mean it's still copyrighted? You just don't call it yes. Yuzong Vong? Just to be like. Uh, I'm pretty sure it's still. Muzong Vong? Yeah. <laughs> Gosh darn it. They're not even going to oh. use it and then just sit <laughs> on it. I'd say that's, that's, that's like. It's a crime against humanity. My question, though, in regards to the squads, is that will they bring back the land train? I am going to take a punt, and I'm probably going to be wrong. (laughs) I'm going to say no, or if they do, it won't be as long as that. Sorry, I pulled it up. That's that's amazing. This is... (laughs) <laughs> like, I think I think they might use like the front carriage of the land train as like this is their equivalent to the land raider, but I don't think they're going to go for the full train just because obviously that's on the epic scale and they were designed to measure up with. I mean, I've not seen one. I, I should I didn't look at the article close enough to see one up against the Titan, but I feel like they're more too big of a scale to do like that length with that many guns. I mean, at least it's not as big as the Colossus. It reminds me of like one of those little train sets you'd have as a kid that were like magnetic and you just like stick them together. <laughs> Absolutely. That, and that's not like a knock on them. I think that's amazing. <laughs> I love it. I wonder if they're going to reference some older developments or some things about the older lore that ended up getting ch- changed or slightly altered or were like never referenced again kind of thing. Because, like, um, you know how, like, the original law for Mark III power armor, um, mm-hmm. oh, Mark III was developed because of the Imperium's battles against the Squats, and that forced the Imperium to develop Mark III, so maybe that would uh, actually explicitly state that again, which would be nice. Yeah, they say in the article that, they, that old fans will find lots of good references to their old stuff, so I don't know exactly what they're going to keep and what they're going to change and which bits they're going to subtly shuffle off to one side, but... I mean, they do make it clear that there's no love lost between the squats and humanity, so then 
more than likely going to allow them to fight each other and have them fight each other throughout history. So I think there's certainly a chance of that, but which bits they keep and which bits they don't, I think I'd hesitate. Because in the original law, um, during the Great Crusade, the Imperium tried to reintegrate all the squat worlds, known as the home worlds, back into the Imperium, and the Imperium and the squats were like, no, actually, we like being independent, thanks, and that resulted in a huge brutal war, and because the Great Crusade was basically dragging on behind so much because of the fights with the squats, um, basically the Imperium said, all right, we'll, form, we'll, we'll stop fighting, we'll form a treaty, we'll leave you alone, we'll give you a degree of autonomy, but in exchange, we want you to contribute some of your troops towards the Imperial Army, and the squats were like, all right, fuck it, fine. Isn't that basically the same as the Treaty of Olympus with the Mechanicum, then? Uh, no. Well, not the same, but like the idea of... No, because okay. the, the, treaty the Treaty of Olympus had a lot less violence. Okay, fair point. Or at least certainly it, it happened before all the violence. Because I know there were a fair few in the Mechanicum not happy with the Treaty of Olympus. No, the, tr the Treaty of the Squad happened after all the violence, and they, and they only did it because, like, hey, these guys are draining all our resources and keeping our knocking our plans back so fucking much we have no choice kind of thing yeah the squats were never going to win but they were also probably never going to lose either yeah it was a stalemate yeah yeah but better it's just basically it, the imperium in a nutshell it would just take so much effort probably so at a certain point they're like we're really just gonna waste a lot of time to get not very far and then the nids showed up and ate most of them that was certainly what Jervis Johnson hand waved them away with in third edition we'll see exactly how they square that circle because that was actually referenced in the Libas in Elogis as well, in under the squat entry. You had, you had um, the rogue trainer said, oh yes, I heard rumours that their homeworlds were consumed by an alien fleet. Kind of thing. Yeah, we'll see exactly how, like I say, how liberal they decide to be with the old law and which bits are sort of twisted to allow the squat. Because if the, if the squat homeworlds get eaten by the Tyranids, I'm sorry, you don't get the squats back on a scale like this pretty much ever without the independent because they're an independent empire the imperium would basically just say ah you've had your home worlds eaten we'll just take in your refugees and now you work for us so i feel like they can't have had the squat worlds eaten but maybe well, you, lost you a lot do, you could always you know do the um the quarian argument essentially but basically like, oh the survivors were basically uh, compiled into a migrant fleet yeah so they're just kind of whoop I mean, but at that point, wouldn't somebody have run into them at some point? I mean, I guess it's just like reintroducing something old is going to be hard regardless. Funnily enough, that was actually heavily implied at the end of one of the Psychic Awakening books, because an Adeptus Mechanicus first of all was fired upon, and they said, was that the reports say that this race is officially extinct. That wrestle belongs to the SQUA, and then feed cuts out. Oh, yeah. That was Basically in implying it was the squads. That was in the Greater Good book, book five, I remember. Hmm. Yeah. Or at least I think I do. I do think that, like, in different books they would like to reference him. Gosh, what was there? I feel like there was one by Dan Abnett that also had a squat in it. Like, one of the Eisenhorn books or one alongside of those that series? It's been a long time, though, so... <laughs> yeah, I've not read them, I can't say. Fun enough, um, the latest Cal Jericho book has um, a squat as one of the main characters in it. And the way he's introduced is brilliant because, like, he's like beating the crap out of all these mutants, and he had this bounty hunter go to him, like, "Ah, oh, hello, Grendelson. Still short tempered, I see." And the squat just stops and goes, "Was that a joke about my height?" And the bounty hunter just goes, "Why did it go over your head?" <laughs> <laughs> Ding. Spicy. Mind you, that book also had the one scene of like uh, Cal Joker describing his wife, like, "Oh yes, Yolanda. I once saw her beat a man to death with another man." <laughs> Lit she's doing. literally the embodiment of like have you ever been so mad you beat a motherfucker with another motherfucker kind of thing <laughs> <laughs> hey I like that kind of person kind of character I'm Absolutely. okay with that and if you want an army of people who are that angry may I interest you in the world eaters by collecting them in the Horus Heresy because we have got new tactical marines sorry I needed a segue because we're going to talk about squats for two hours otherwise <laughs> I, I don't think that people would mind us talking about squats. No, I don't, think, you, I don't think they would mind us talking, but also... Um, <laughs> if you would like a dedicated two-hour squat podcast, leave a comment below. <laughs> oh, no, they'll actually do that now, you know. Yeah, you know they the, will actually do they that. They will actually want that. And, ta and Tad's going to do the entire episode with an Italian accent. Go away. <laughs> <laughs> Ow, I just punched my microphone to get the point <laughs> Ow. You, you tried to punch me through your microphone. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, uh, 
It's every time a head desk, you don't hear it. So I thought we would do something different to get the idea of a head desk across, and I just punched my microphone. Ow! That was very really stupid of you. <laughs> yes, I know. It's a Friday. I'm tired. I didn't. I didn't even hear it. But yes, uh, <laughs> new beakies. Indeed, this is the Legion Tactical Squad, the third. Um, people are like, oh my god, new plastic marines is the first heresy plastic marines ever. And then conveniently forget that Mark III and Mark IV marines are right there. Yeah, the beaky In boys. plastic. They're my favourite helmet. <laughs> oh yeah, the Mark VI armour is the best. I, I do stand by Mark VI being my favourite space marine armour, I think. I will say um, this though, it... It, I don't like the crest for the sergeants. I don't like it. It does. It, it they are weird. a lot. It looks a little. They are it a looks lot. a little tacked on, to be real. Mm. It doesn't. It doesn't look like it goes with it. No, but you could probably get away without putting it there as long as you make it clear that they've got the special weapons, and they actually do put special weapons in this kit, which is good. Mm. A really dinky plasma pistol, like that, is such a tiny plasma pistol. Um, a really nice power sword. I think I've seen other variants as well. Um, they come with the auxilia, the nuncio vox, and bayonets and chain bayonets. Uh, and I've seen in uh, a couple of rules leaks that they are going to have rules for bayonets and chain bayonets on your bolters. A fix which bayonets. Is quite neat. I'm sorry, I was obligated to say that. Oh yeah, well, absolutely <laughs> obligated. True. But no, actual rules for bayonets which should be good for combat-oriented legions like the world eaters because it means that they can still have all the fire they want and still do something in melee. I will say the crest looks much better on the Mark III helmet. Agreed. I I have I have yeah I think I've got thirty Mark III Marines and I really like it on them uh, for my burning of Prospero stuff. I do really like it on them. I'm gonna be real though. It just kind of it just kind of looks like it reminds me of, like the kind of brushes you use to like dust things. <laughs> it's just that's just what I think. It's it's a polish in the bolt in mid battle. In uh, all seriousness, I think the crest would look better if they change the orientation so it's more like parallel with the helmet yeah like a mohawk kind better. of thing i think i'll look better for the beakies i would agree yeah, i mean someone will try it i'm sure i do just think the front forward facing one looks better just because the side one i think it just adds too much like there's too much space in between the um the frill and yeah. like, the helmet and it's just a little weird <laughs> yeah it doesn't follow the curvature of the helm and now i'm getting all arty farty <laughs> You know what I mean? Hey, I mean, I draw, they so also, that's why I notice these things. Yeah, that's fair. They also showed off a few alternate paint schemes. So obviously the main poster for this edition of Heresy is clearly the Sons of Horus. Uh, but they also showed an Ultramarine, uh, an Iron Hand or a Raven Guard. I think it's an I, I think it's a Raven Guard now I look at it again. Black, because Black Hand's Raven they, Guard, yeah. Yeah. Um, a Death Guard. And the Death Guard looks sick um, with this these Marines. Usually I like mentally always kind of see the um the death guard actually looks really good with it though like, like, i do I, and then a night lord sergeant without the helm with a plasma pistol and a lightning claw so again more weapon options confirmed it's my favorite lightning claws i will always i always want lightning claws even if yeah. they're not always viable <laughs> i just know something as well which a few, which um i think a few people pointed out as well is that trigger discipline i see <gasps> with the what do you mean oh my goodness like, is that with the the plasma pistol? On the, on the Death Guard, trigger discipline. It's basically like when you don't walk around with your finger right on the trigger, so you basically keep your finger out of the trigger. Yeah, set. that's true, actually, on a couple of them. There's a couple of them on the Auxilia's got the same thing. Anyone who's not actively aiming and firing has their finger over the stock rather than on the trigger. So, yeah, trigger discipline. Yeah, that's attention to detail. I appreciate it. Mm, they, they didn't have to do that, but they have, and, and and it's been noted. So well done, whoever individuals were involved in the design of this kit. I mean, that's a, that's the thing about forty k models, though. Really, just any model from GW is that they tried to put a lot of detail in it, and that's like that's the Gucci stuff. Mm. It's all Gucci. Am I down with the kids yet? <laughs> <laughs> How do you do, fellow kids? With all the maymays and all that. Aye. But they do confirm that every Thursday in April, so there'll be three more... 15, 20, 20, 20, 20 yep. Yeah. So there'll be three more heresy previews uh, this month with um, some new models revealed. So we'll have two more heresy reveals to talk about next episode and one more on the episode after. Though what form they take at the moment, we do not know. A lot of people are hoping for vehicles, um, but we'll see exactly what they decide to do. 
I'm hoping we get a plastic Sakaar or something. Doesn't he? Or, or at the very least a plastic rhino. Oh, I know. I was thinking of the Catosicarius. Sorry. But I was like, wait a second. <laughs> <laughs> I think he has a model. But I don't think that's what you're talking about. <laughs> <laughs> now, now someone's going to put one of those helmets on the tank and go, I, Catosicarian. <laughs> there I did. Um, and if you are interested in getting involved in the Heresy, now admittedly uh, there was a bit of a, a schmoz about this. There was there is a Horus Heresy Open Day kind of thing, a big if, yeah Horus Heresy Open Day taking place uh, next month in May. Um, but weird, well not weirdly, it sold out like that. There, I saw a lot of people complaining on Twitter about how quickly this event sold out. It sold out in like five minutes. And people are like, did they actually sell any tickets for this? Uh, so yeah, it's it's a thing. Uh, there will apparently be some top content creators from around the community. I have no idea who those individuals are. Not me, uh, obviously. Um, but yeah, we'll see. Not me either. <laughs> yeah, it was me. I, I imagine there might I be things like, ba- like battle report channels and stuff. Maybe you bought yep, all the tickets. Every you? every one of them. I don't even know what the event is. I just bought them all. <laughs> You scalper. <laughs> <laughs> so I know it's like not even Kiri have got an invite or anything like that. No, um, honestly, I couldn't tell you. And I think we'll find out as uh, as time goes by who is going to be there because they don't make that very clear. Or maybe they were just expecting the YouTubers to be able to get a ticket and would just rock up anyway. And they just kept it secret because they genuinely don't know who's coming. Who knows? Probably. <laughs> I mean, I, I feel like that would be kind of a silly way to put plan things you usually want to even like at a convention you're like hey we want you to come to our convention and like talk to yeah, them yeah but it's gw so who that knows fair. <laughs> oh yeah um as a recording tomorrow we'll see the release or oh, pre-order dates for the uh the nid codex indeed codex terms they've been showing off different rules all week uh stratagems the crusade rules adaptive physiologies uh, hyper-adaptive de- uh, post-deployment rules just to around with your opponent even more. Um, and they're also releasing this week on pre-order the AOS Season of War uh, with the Cronspine Incarnate and Terrain and stuff as well as the Seasons of War book which is basically the same idea as the War Zones for, for Warhammer 40,000 and I am not happy that they're doing it because it's annoying and it's just price gouging and it's... Uh, but it- and it'll be out of date in six months anyway. If they, so. And it'll be out of date, yeah. If they release, like, Tyranid <laughs> stuff, are they also going to write about their bonus rolls towards squats? Oh. <laughs> we'll find out, probably. Yeah, maybe. Oh, speaking of Warzones, um, they also revealed the next um, Warzone Knackman book as well, didn't they? They did. Rift War. Um, so, basic plot is... Uh, Harkon World Claimer has been sent on Abaddon's behalf after Abaddon nearly lost the vengeful spirit taking Vigilus. Um, so Harkon World Claimer has been sent to take the Narkomon Gauntlet and the Imperium has basically done what it always does when it has a heavily contested region of chaos space, make a series of chapters to be wardens of the region. They've literally copied what they did in the Badab systems all over again. And the Eye uh, of Terror. And the Eye of Terror, that too. So the Castellans of the Rift are the Fleet Guardian chapter. And they called all the Space Marines, forming a group known as the Wardens of the Gauntlet that hold the line whilst reinforcements arrive. Yeah, the Imperium is doing exactly the same thing it always does. Now, Wardens of the Gauntlet, there will be a massive missed opportunity if they didn't make all those chapters Iron Hands. Or at least an Iron Hands descendant, yeah. That's what I mean, all, all Iron Hands successors, basically, yeah. Oh, all Iron Hands. Sorry, yeah, I missed yeah. that. Sorry. Just for the point like, hey, it's the Gauntlet, and what has a Gauntlet and Iron Hand? Oh, okay, hey. okay, I see what you're I was like, where are you going with this? <laughs> you, can, you can also do with Imperial Fists as well, there you go. Just Imperial Fists and Iron Hands to fool the gauntlet. There you go. It was my shitty attempt at a joke. Okay? <laughs> I mean, no, it's clever. It just went off from my head. <laughs> just like that squat did. Hey, we're back at squats again. Do, 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 do. <laughs> Bomb. But yes, there's there's plenty going on in the book if you are interested in it. There's apparently a codex supplement. I don't know who for. Possibly demons. Um, but couldn't tell you for sure. Codex supplement for squats. There you go. But we'll see. Get yeah, the, rule. yeah, the rules <laughs> early. <laughs> demon squats, obviously. Everything has to be... Chaos squats. There you go. <laughs> we get you. It's like chaos dwarves, but with squats. Oh, guys. Hey, I mean, I don't know. I don't think that would work as an army by itself, but that would still be fun to have in like a 
Chaos Army? No? Maybe? I don't know. <laughs> I mean, they still need to do the Lost and the Damned with the Traitor card and all of that. That's one oh, code God, they yeah. do need to do. Do you know what they, they should do? Um, they should do what they did for, um, well, for the Eldari Codex. Just basically roll to save, like, it's front of the book, you know, it's like Chaos Space Marines, then have Lost and the Damned at the back. Yeah, possibly, because and just to it's... call it Codex Chaos. There you go. Yeah, it's because it's ironic that the Tyranids can take more Imperial Guard units than Chaos can. That's just funny. <laughs> yeah. Maybe it's just because the, the Chaos Guards turn into, like, different, like, mini-demons and stuff, so they're not... They're there, guys. They're totally there. They're just, uh, you just have to buy different models, obviously, forehead. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you can take Chaos Cultists, but you can't take any of the vehicles, you can't take any of the other units, whereas the Gene Stealer Cults go, oh, that's a nice Imperial Guard army you have there. Shame if someone were to copy and paste it, and then twist the rules a little bit. But, and give yeah. them Gene Stealers. And give them Gene Stealers, yeah. So it's actually better than the Imperial Guard army. In some ways, yeah. The, ar- the, ar- or the enemy will never see it coming. They won't have any pants. There was also they're an dead. attempt at a joke. <laughs> I was just like, yes, but tagged in the head desk, so it doesn't count. Oh. <laughs> if, if, if a good joke is qualified by me head desking, then you make one good joke an episode. Hooray! At most. Oh. I'm, 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 mostly, I'm mostly taking the make a rem here, rather than you. <laughs> because that, his, his system of only funny of tag head desks means he makes one funny joke every two or three episodes. Oh, God. Yeah, that sounds about right for me, actually. <laughs> Saying nothing. But if you are a Chaos player um, and you're wanting something a little bit bigger for your army, uh, we got a more detailed look this week at the Chaos Knights kit. Uh, the Knight Abominant and the War Dogs as well. Uh, so they've got just a bit of a look at all the different weapons they can take. So we already knew about the all melee variant, the Carnivore which has a Reaper Chain Talon and a Slaughter Claw um, and more speed. Uh, You can have a War Dog Stalker, which is part gun, part melee, including a Demon Breath Spear, because you can't just call it a Melter Cannon. Um, And the War Dog Brigand, which has two uh, ranged weapons, uh, including a Havoc Launcher, uh, and it's clearly got those two weapons again. Um, in there and the Knight Abominant uh, has something called a Volkite Combuster um, which is a really nasty name for that gun Uh, we were right when we saw that revealed it is Volkite Um, and it's got I was going to make a very terrible joke saying that it it should call it the Adam Cole gun because it's all about the boom (laughs) I don't get it. Uh, it's also got the Electro <laughs> Scourge and Terrorjace. It's birds are actually an ability or a weapon that it's armed with, those crows that live around it. Um, it's also obviously got the um, psychic powers, which can buff or debuff. I don't think, I don't, doesn't seem to suggest it's damage, uh, but it probably will do damage. Wouldn't those birds be like enormous? Because like a titan probably. is also just like huge. Just looking at the model, it's like... I was, They'd yeah. probably be the equivalent of the size of a half seagull. A what? A half yeah. seagull. It was a, it was a bird native to New Zealand that went extinct only a, a couple of um, a couple of hundred years ago, actually. Um, it actually um, was large enough to actually uh, prey upon humans. Oh, that's horrifying. It's, it's um, Before humans arrived in New Zealand, its uh, main prey was um, elephant birds. You know, what, you know what? Maybe it's okay if some things just aren't around anymore. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, Hast Eagle, uh, when did it, Kitax, when did it go out? When did, I was going when did it go out of business? Yeah. When did it go extinct? <laughs> yeah, it went extinct in the 1400s. Oh, goodness. F in the chat for our man-eating bird, bird friends. <laughs> but anyway, I think yeah, I, and, I and, did and, 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 and if it on birds, basically, that were bigger than ostriches. Oh, gosh, but then they could, like, fly in the really, look. Ostriches are mean. Yeah, they can fly as well, yeah. Oh, gosh. <laughs> Not the ostriches, but the eagles. <laughs> <laughs> I would be terrified if ostriches can fly because there's farms around here of ostriches and they're really mean. <laughs> yep. So, yeah, that, that was a tangent. <laughs> that's what basically, that's what's sitting on top of the Chaos Knight, Hearts Eagles. But just evil versions. Hmm. 
And if well, you don't, they only weighed about fifteen kilograms. Oh my goodness! Only fifteen yeah, kilograms. I know. For for a flying animal, that's that's light. It depends, obviously, with hollow bones and all that sort of stuff. If you're going to fly, you need to be quite light. I know, but it's saying like an animal that big, only fifteen kilograms. That's light as fuck. Oh, okay. Uh, that's on. So that's like thirty-three pounds. Okay. Yeah, thirty-three pounds. Yeah, yeah, I'm heavier than that. Huh. <laughs> Yeah, you might be faster and deadlier than me, Bird, but I'm more heavy, so come on. <laughs> you can't pick me up. Bird immediately picks me up. Oh, no. <laughs> I have miscalculated. My one advantage. The DuckTales <laughs> Moon theme plays. <laughs> That's a reference to that <laughs> Just a bit. <laughs> yeah, it also just trying to drag this back to the original point. Um, <laughs> if you don't want the Knight Psyker, you can build a sort of ma- mixed variant with a laser destructor, um, which the Imperium doesn't have anymore. Or you can go full melee with the Knight Rampager. Uh, so, you know, you can have an all melee Chaos Knight army if you wish, or you could have all guns and psychic powers Chaos Knight army if you wish. So I think it's good that obviously... Knight players are normally, I have one gun and I have one smashy thing. Or sometimes I have two guns. Chaos Knights can go, screw your guns, I'm running you down and smashing you in the face. So, good to have more variations, I say. Oh, yeah. Hooray! Violence! It's Warhammer. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, it should also be noted that um, the Chaos Knights will probably be in the Chaos Space Marine Codex, judging by this. Um, oh no, that's a lie. No, oh, no. They, they, no, they no, announced no, no, the codex. I'm they wrong. announced I'm the wrong. codex. I'm wrong. Because remember last time we, I, I complained like they missed the opportunity to have the two knights facing off against one another as a throwback to the Renegade box set. Oh yeah, no, it makes a point in here that the the Psyker Knight can be taken with the mark of corn. I think. Wait, or it, but corn doesn't like. Well, it's, it's a, well, to quote the article, followers of Corn will be pleased to know that the new codex has room for bloodthirsty abominants too. So clearly you can take like those weapons, like the Electro Scourge and all that, and maybe just give up the psychic powers for the mark of Corn. I don't know. I was gonna say I genuinely don't like, know. I don't think Corn likes psychers. Like <laughs> He Korn doesn't like anyone. You know <laughs> no, Corn just likes violence. You know what? Not liking anybody, that's a mood. <laughs> yeah, I was reading, uh, speaking of corn, I was reading the White Dwarf for uh, last month, which had a Blades of Corn update for AOS. And yeah, the background for the Blades of Corn is, um, it's pretty damn grim. Dark. Whoa. In my 40k? Just like, like in Warhammer? Like, it's not like, by the standards of Warhammer, it's pretty standard fare, but it was just like, oh yeah, like, all of the basic foot soldiers in corn blades of corn armies are cannibals. Just there's your starting point. I mean, I'm not surprised. Where else are they going to get food? I don't think they really like. I don't think they really think about that. They just show up and be like, "Hey, I'm hungry." Kills thing. Mm, yeah, I guess I could eat it. I mean, the origin. Yeah, the origin of it goes back to uh, the original lore of where the blades of corn came from, the bloodbound, because in the realm of Fire, yeah, Realm of Fire. Corn conquered it during the Age of Chaos, and the rivers ran with blood instead of water, and this, that, the other. Basically, it was subsistence for survival or cannibalism. And to join the Corn Bloodbound, who were the dominant mortal force in the region, you basically their induction ritual was cannibalism. I'm not going to comment any further on it, but that's the origin of it. Mm. Like if you want, if you if you're hardcore enough to hang with us, then you're willing to murder your tribe and then eat them. So yeah, yeah, I'm gonna leave that there and move That's on because 40K. it's just. I'm not surprised. <laughs> ah, yeah. Though, uh, if you're wanting something a little more edgy, uh, well, I wouldn't say edgy, edgy, but a little bit less ultra violence in your Warhammer, then might I direct you to? Uh, the word bearers in Dawn of Fire Book 4, Throne of Light, because Corfairon's back! Yay. <laughs> Absolutely perfect reaction to Corfairon. 
I mean, it's better than, you know, the reaction of, like, Erebus is back. It's like, oh, good, let me get my hammer. <laughs> it's, like a, yeah. it's like an image that I have on, um, someone would respond with, like, dumb things, just being like, come, it's like a little stick figure that says, come here, and has a rock. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds about right, yeah. But, yeah, uh, New Dawn of Fire book, so, um. Uh... I mean, I've quite enjoyed them. To be fair, I've read all three, and whilst Avenging Sun was a bit of a hard read, the plot was fine. Gate of Bones was really good. Wolf Time for a Space Wolves book was really good. Um, so I think it'll actually be pretty all right. And it's quite an interesting plot thread as well in terms of, like, the word bearers are going after the black ships. They're not going after the Imperium's military. They're going after the Emperor's food. So... Quite an interesting plot thread to do. Or doing the most evil thing out of all. He's intercepting the Emperor's Deliveroo order. <laughs> or Uber Eats for you guys in America. Or DoorDash. Yeah. Or DoorDash, yes. It makes reference to someone called Inquisitor Rostov and the Hand of Abaddon. Is that Battlefleet Gothic reference? Inquisitor Rostov? I never really kept up with Battlefleet Gothic. That was like the show that my dad would play on TV, and then I was like younger, and I'm like, oh, things are happening. <laughs> <laughs> Rostov was the Inquisitor from um, Avenging Sun. Oh, it's been like nearly a year since I read it, so that's probably why. The one oh, who has the um, that weird four-eyed fish alien in his retinue. The one who kept carrying the, the ball of tinfoil. What book is that again? Avenging Sun. Uh, it's the first, yeah, the first Dawn of Fire book. Oh, Lacrance guy. Yeah, yeah, I remember now. Uh, yeah, that makes sense. Okay, yeah, I'd forgotten some of this because I've read so much and it's been so long since I actually... Like, I feel like I read Dawn of Fire around the time I moved into this flat. I don't think I even had my sofa at the time. Um, so, no it, was, no, it was pretty much around the time I moved into this flat, like nearly two years ago. So it's been a while since I read it and that's why I'd forgotten. But no, I'm skim reading the Lexicano now and a lot of this rings a bell. So it was familiar, you just pinpointed it on the wrong thing, but I mean, that's fair. I mean, 40k makes so many references, so it's like, eh. Yeah, I think it's because from Battlefleet Gothics, the game, the video game, talks about the Hand of Midnight and using it against Abaddon, and I've conflated that with the Hand of Abaddon, um, because, you know, fusion dance, two common things, same theme. Um, so, yeah, apologies, got that one wrong. But yeah, yeah, is there any... any Thing else that is new and exciting in the 40k community um there is another series of books making a return alongside dawn of fire uh warhammer crime is back has anyone actually read the warhammer crime books i've not, I've not seen anyone no. posting reviews of them or anything like that no i haven't if i'm honest like i really like the idea of it and i probably should just read them because crime novels Crossed with 40k just sounds like a really good idea, oh, but it, no, I haven't read them at all, like, and I probably like should. Detective books, yeah, um, like it's sort of it's all set on one city, one massive hive city, mm-hmm. talking about the enforcers and the real scum of the earth kind of place type thing, a street level view of this vast and decaying futuristic city. To quote the article, yeah, I was gonna say that does sound like at least a good introduction for people to really kind of understand like the tone of 40k at least like from a small scale level for like underhive stuff or yeah it'd be a good place to go from or a similar segue to like necromunda novels i could imagine Mm. oh this one's about the um the rattling and the (gasps) ogre it is it's the sequel to their original audio drama dredge runners um by alec warley and it's called the wraithbone phoenix which is a really cool name. I mean, it's a novel where an ogre and a rattling are basically the main characters, so that alone is intriguing enough a prospect. Yeah, a fast-talking rattling and his ogre sidekick. Please tell me it's going to be like one of those like 1940s-style type gangsters, you know, where the ogre's like, da, okay, boy. <laughs> kind of thing. You'll have to listen to the audio drama and get back to me on that. And the little, and the little rattling sounds like... like like, right, listen here, see, we're going to be running a wreck in this town. Down Cape Boys. <laughs> if that's not how it's on the order drone, then make it so. Just get a get a bunch of fans together and read it like that. 
Every other word coming from the rattling is she. Listen here, she. God, I miss the old Looney Tunes cards. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, I think I might actually pick up a couple of these, like uh, Flesh and Steel, Grim Repast, uh, Bloodlines. I might make a point of actually reading it so that there's, there is somewhere on the internet recorded evidence of someone reading Warhammer Cry. <laughs> Yeah, because I, I think, like, I, I've not seen anyone write anywhere about, um, like, Warhammer Horror. And I think, like, me talking about, like, um, like uh, one of the books was, like, the first time it's actually been mentioned anywhere. We did an episode with Alpha where he reviewed one or two. He did a short story, didn't he? Mm. Yeah, that creature in the water or something like that? N- no, it was one where it was, like, it was a village full of psychers and, like, the psychers and the village was being, like, surrounded by Sisters of Silence. I feel like there was one with this, like, creature in the well type thing, which was... I, I don't remember. I really don't remember top of my head. Um, it was... It would have been episode... Either, it would have been 40... It might have been episode 47 when we had Alpha on the first time. I genuinely do not remember. No, because um, Warhammer Horror wasn't a thing back then. Hmm. It's still relatively recent. True. Because it, it came out after the first... Siege, long after the first Siege of Terror book came out. Because that's when you can still buy a physical book from Black Library. Comments, you know what to do. Get on it and remind us. Like, I have no recollection. I think the last book I remember, that was like ages ago. It was almost like one of the first ones. There was like a sister battle in it. And it was like, that's all I remember. (laughs) Oh, gosh. Fair enough. (laughs) Um, That's fine. I need to check if the coming soon page has been updated. Because they really fucking do these days. Uh, da, 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 da. Uh, no, it's still the same as last time. So no new updates as of yet. Though I am still curious as to why, like, um, in French and in German, you can get Horus Heresy omnibuses, but you can't get them in English. Oh, I think I have one in... Uh, no, I think I just have the first Horus Heresy book in uh, Spanish. Which is kind of cool. Like, because um, they've been releasing, like... um. Omnibuses are like like three or four books at a time as one omnibus kind of thing, but only for like French and German for some reason. I mean, I would only guess maybe they're like, oh man, it's such a pain to translate all these books and then release them individually book by book. They're like, just take the omnibus, just just smash them together and just throw them out there. <laughs> They'd be still doing all the work for translating them. It's just like they're just putting them into one book rather than releasing them in three. Yeah. I mean... I don't know about you, but when I go to the used bookstore, it is very annoying when someone buys, like, book one, but then doesn't buy any of the other books. So it'll be like, book one is gone, and it's like, two, three, four. Oh, I'm like, well, yeah. I don't want to buy the second one if I don't have the first one. Yeah, that's annoying. It's like when you get on Netflix, for example, and you have like, oh, yes, you have a se- season of a show, you have a show you want to watch, and it only starts from season two. <laughs> it's like, what's the what's the point? <laughs> <laughs> like, what? Why, why would you even bother? I don't understand. <laughs> I know they did that with Spice and Wolf. Like, literally, I, lo- I looked at that and it's like, oh, yes, one season, season two. How the fuck? Season one. What's the point? <laughs> <laughs> then you get that other ones that are like, you're like, oh, yes, season eight, season 12. <laughs> it's here just like way out. <laughs> you're like, what? <laughs> if you're going to just put one season in, you might as well just make it season one, <laughs> surely. Because <laughs> uh, if you, I figure at that point, if you are like at season eight, then you've already found something else to do, like one through seven. And why would you switch to another service just to see season eight? <laughs> Silly. Rights issues, ladies and gentlemen. Rights issues. <laughs> I mean, I know it's not the same. I'm just having a look through this article about the Exodite, like they're talking about the final episode, because that's out on Warhammer Plus at the minute. And I'm actually having a look at this bit of animation. Um, I'll, I'll send you the link to the article because I can't copy and paste the link to the, the video clip. But there's a, a clip in the bottom of like battle suits against this uh, baby. It's either a, I think it's a warlord uh, type of top of my head, and I don't know. Like the the, the flying animation looks really clunky. Oh. <laughs> it looks so clunky. <laughs> I tell you what it looks like. It looks like um, someone's got like a like an action figure just going. Neow. Like I get, like I don't know how to have battle suits actually, you know, fly all the time. But it, oh it, no, it, it does look really silly. It looks like you could just kind of got them like 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 the bottles like on a stick. 
or like on a on a string, and you're just kind of pulling them across the screen, like. Yee! <laughs> I, I, I'm I'm partly curious as to why the warlord isn't using its point defenses against the the flying bowsers, and just using its main armaments. It like, is. It, yeah, it yeah, is. but like. Yeah, it's using its main armaments, but why aren't you using the point defenses like, you know, the heavy bolters and the las cannons? No, it is. There's, it, it, you don't see it all the time, but there is a very short bit where there's, they're flying on the Titan where you do see one of its point defense guns fire. So it is using them. It's just for that particular shot, it's firing at the volcano. Yeah, I was cannon. saying, in that clip, it doesn't look like it. <laughs> I feel like they... Yeah, it's only for like half a second. They're, if they're already really like kind of it. based off of... Gundams, in a sense, I would have just looked at those guys to see how they make it look cool to fly around, or else they're just like, Wee! yeah, to be honest, that's what I should have done, yeah. Mm. But they do actually, in that episode, give us a look at something that maybe we've seen before in Battlefleet Gothic, uh, but as I haven't played it, uh, I'm not sure, is a Nikasar ship. Uh, the Nikasar, for those who don't know, are a race of psychers who the Tau have allied with, and they act as sort of scout ships um, and things like that. The Pancake Polar Bears. The what? Is that the right, is that the right something of the Pancake Polar Bears? I don't, I don't think we've ever seen a Nikasar in person. Uh, no, but or, I, th- I think it would describe it as like being like having like a, flat, like a flat body with like a bear-like face, and they, fl- and they hovered. Um, just reading the article now very quickly. Uh, technology... Do, 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 do. Go away, advert. Uh, I'm not at my PC or else I would just like Photoshop a polar bear face on a pancake. (laughs) Uh, Jervis Johnson described a Nikasar as flat, round, floating polar bears. Uh, Fair enough. I'm trying to read the wiki article, but it's not being that helpful in terms of physiology. So... That's what what Jervis Johnson himself says. I'll go by that. Flat, flat, flying polar bears. There you go. As they are back, it. Right, I got. I got. Um, right. Uh, official description from that's on Lexicon. Um, ivory hair quills, stubby clawed limbs, no eyes, and uh, have glands in their avian skulls. So basically, kind of weird, weird mix of polar bear, bird, and pancake. Yeah, and it says they float in a heel sphere. Like they they float around inside things rather than just walking around. Um. Speaking of these ships, they were actually... They did actually have models in Battlefleet Gothic. Yeah, I'm seeing the picture of them now, and I'm like, oh, well, never mind, it wasn't such a cool reveal after all. We had seen them before. I mean, it's, it's, we got, we get to see one, you know, on TV, essentially. Absolutely. Rather, rather than I just mean, a very, very tiny, tiny, tiny-ass 254 by 156 JPEG. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, it looks cool. Don't get me wrong. I thought that it was something, like, brand new, rather than... Uh, yeah, my brain just didn't engage. Never mind. I mean, it does sound like a rather extra piece of lore rather than the general stuff, so... I mean, I didn't even hear of the pancake polar bears, so... <laughs> I mean, flat bodies, bear-like face, pancake polar bear. There you go. <laughs> yeah. So, if you're looking for someone who has more of a, a bear-like physiology without being so flat... uh. May I direct you to Blood Bowl? Because we got two star players this week, actually, for the Norse team. Yeah. Is one a bear? Um, no. Um, unfortunately, no. He does seem to have a bear skin boots and a belt, but he's not a bear. Could I make him so, a bear? Could I put a bear head on him? Um, possibly. Um, so you get a star player called... What's his name? Ivar Eriksson. Clearly, someone had been taking takes from Vince McMahon on how to name people. Um, That's just Carl the Deranged. (laughs) (laughs) That's just Carl. (laughs) That Um, is literally just Carl. (laughs) And a dwarf called Thorson Stoutmead, who instead of throwing a ball, is throwing a beer keg. That's a waste of beer. Well, maybe it's empty. You better have drunk it before throwing it. Maybe that's why he's throwing it. He's like, this bitch empty, and then like tossed it. I mean, once per drive, he can throw a keg at an opponent and immediately knock them down on a three plus, so. Only if he shouts yeet. Yeet, yeah, wee bastard, kind of thing. <sighs> dear, oh dear. But yes, uh, new star players for Blood Bolt. They look good. Uh, they always do, to be fair. The Blood Bolt models are always really good. S- still, no, you know, it's not the same as the beer pigs, though. No, that was that was definitely unique. The, the beer pigs were the best Blood Bolt minis ever. Beer pigs? 
<laughs> oh, you've not seen the beer pigs? I have not seen the beer pigs. They're literally pigs that have, like, cakes of beer on them. Be- um, oh, yeah, okay. Oh, my goodness. It's like there's, like, uh, the picture of the big fluffy dog that has, like, the little keggy thing as, like, a collar, but this is, like, the pig. Oh, like a St. Bernard. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Fluffy doggy boys. i tell you what it, re- what it reminds me of. Um, you know that meme when someone's ordering from Domino's and it says, send your cutest delivery boy, and the, the dog's got the pizza on its back? <gasps> I would that you know oh. that that's what I are. Oh my goodness! I would, I would want my food to be I delivered not seen by this cute meme? doggy. <laughs> have you not I seen this no, meme? I've never no, no, I don't this. know if it's just a, an Instagram thing rather than a Twitter thing. But no, I haven't seen this meme. Well, now you have. Indeed, I'm learning things. So there you go, Domino's. You want to get you know, some good service? You send your cutest delivery boy. Make sure it's a do- make sure it's a doggo. There you go. I mean, would you send your dog to pick up your Domino's order, Ramlays? No, my dog would eat it. <laughs> <laughs> Unfortunately, my cat... Susie, he's got a mouth like a vacuum cleaner. He'll just, like, <laughs> gobble up anything in his path. Like. <laughs> well, so you see, that's the that, that's the uh, price of convenience. You know? Your upcharge. It's not really like a charge. It's more like a portion of your food. But, and by portion, I mean all of it. <laughs> Surprisingly, I have a cat that does the same thing though if i have food she wants to eat it that's just how it is she wants to share sounds like my cats as well <laughs> they'll just scream that the, their bowl was empty he's like you have food in your bowls like, but i can see the bottom therefore it is empty <laughs> i ate all the way in the center and now it's like a donut and it needs to be filled so i'm pretty sure like, everyone who's got a cat can relate to the fact that the whole you know the why is it empty <laughs> Well, I ever I only feed her twice a day because I try to make sure that she has like the right amount of food. But oh my goodness, no, she will she will for about like two hours before food be like, excuse me, excuse me, excuse me, where's my food? I'm supposed to get food. Hello, hello there, food. Just sitting there and just meowing loudly <laughs> in the kitchen. Going, <laughs> Everything short of poking. Oh no, the cats will do that as well. Yeah. Even if it's on like two o'clock in the morning and the cat's side is hungry, it'll start headbutting you like two o'clock in the morning. like, where's my food? Where's my food? I'm hungry. Where's breakfast? The sun has risen, which means that you must rise to give me food. Excuse me. <laughs> and the headbutts normally come after about, you know, a good a half an hour, you know, running spree up and down the house. <laughs> you know, top speed, you know, brum, 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 right, headbutt. Food. I need refueling. <laughs> I was like, go the fuck to sleep. <laughs> I think me and my teaching job just needs not to have a pet because I just, I need a consistent sleep. I cannot be being woken up at two in the morning for feeding a cat or a dog. I just can't do it. I, I need to sleep. <laughs> Could get a fish. They can't wake you up. Or a lizard. They get an iguana. They're like cats, but lizards. Yeah. What? They're like yeah. cats, but lizards. Well, like, temperamentally. Yeah, and an iguana has the disposition of a cat, yeah. They're a good alternative for cats if people have allergies. I didn't know that. Huh. Well, depending on the type of iguana, like, don't go for a rhino iguana, because they're vicious bastards. <laughs> and that's been your pet advice segment of the week. Host <laughs> five And also, two Ataras are not lizards. Stop saying they are. <laughs> Fair enough. Though, um, speaking of lizards and pretty things, um... A, a skink won the Slayer Sword. Hey! Uh, yeah, best painted model at all of Adepticon's Golden Demon went to a skink. A and single a very pre- skink. Oh! And a very pretty skink at that. Hey, yeah, that's actually a really nice one. Look at that. Yeah, the, yeah, they've actually revealed all the gold, silver, and bronzes from Golden Demon at Adepticon, and there are some really good models there. Uh, I've just been scrolling through while you were talking about cats, <laughs> and... There's there's some really good stuff in here. A particular highlight for me is the winner of the dual category because it's the lion and the wolf, which I don't know approve. Really good diorama, yeah. Yeah, that was the winner in the dual category. I like that um, paint scheme on Sigvald. Oh, yeah, that's um, silver in the Age of Sigmar single miniatures category. Um, I like that. It looks nice. 
Right. Yeah, it's an interesting take to yeah, yeah, turn yeah. his to turn his flesh into the same material as his armor and the back of his cloak. And it's like almost like quicksilver. It was what comes to my mind. Gives me like that, but no, it gives me that old like chrome feel in like the eighties kind of artwork. I like it. It's like as I say, it reminds me of, reminds me of like if he was like coming out of the glass of the mirror kind of thing. Yeah, because he was imprisoned in that mirror, weren't he? He was. He was imprisoned in a mirror in Shadespire. So it's like he's taking on the aspects of the mirror into himself, kind of thing. That's what it reminds me of. Like yeah. It. Whereas the winner of the vehicle category for forty k basically just. Painted a beautiful model and then dumped it in a puddle. <laughs> uh, because it's a contempt of treadmill. It just covered in mud. And it's a really... Uh, it looks so effective. Oh, okay. Oh, the um, the Levi- Leviathan dread. The Leviathan, yeah. Yeah. Oh, I've, I've seen some Twitter. For some reason, I've seen people complaining about how it doesn't look good. And it's like, mate, it looks good. What are you on about? Like, how do you effectively convey absolutely caked in mud on a miniature how do you paint and rust covered, and rust yeah how do you paint rusty covered in mud but still functional kill machine in paint it's really effective and really impressive and it takes a lot of skill so yeah we're not going to go through all the entries and all the winners because we'll be here till literally christmas but there are some really really impressive models on display here and i thoroughly recommend Wait a minute, is that Great Unclean one a reference? I can't tell if the... In the Age of Sigmar large category, there's, an, there's a Great Unclean one with a back banner that I swear comes out of the old Lost in the Damned book. Oh, is that what that is? It probably doesn't. But like that banner is so huge. It, like, it reminds me of the Lost in the Damned book with a Great Unclean one on the back. I know it's not, but it, it makes me think of that old book cover with the Great Unclean one in the back. That's how it reminds me. It reminds me of... Um... I think it was like Mark Gibbons' artwork of the Great Unclean one. Which one's that again? Uh, no, no, not Mark Gibbons. Oh, go. Oh, God. Um, hang on. It was one that came around 5th edition fantasy. Or maybe 4th maybe edition. Oh, God. Because um, it's actually not converted. That's the. No, I understand that. It, it, just, it, it reminds me of uh, this. Oh, that's from the Demon's Codex in 5th edition. Mm. Yeah, that's from the 5th edition Demon's mm. Codex. Yeah, the, it, it is, it's the Forge World Great Unclean one. I know one of my friends has got one. They painted it like Mr. Blobby. Um, <laughs> well, it, it was bright pink with yellow guts, so that's as near to Mr. Blobby as you're going to get. Oh, um, oh, you didn't get the yellow spots. Did you ever see the Great Queen No, yellow one, guts. And then someone like like smoothed it over and made it look all like not gross and stuff, and it's almost just as unsettling. <laughs> Oh, the great, the great clean yeah. one. <laughs> oh, Tack, is, is this their model? It isn't, no. Uh, but I know one of my Discord mods also wanted to do a Mr. Blobby Nurgle army. Oh my goodness. Um, that actually looks really good, though. I hate it. It, 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 is, <laughs> it. It's so unnerving. Yeah. It's so unnerving. I always... Now nah, this is more unnerving. Oh, no. <laughs> it's also really just like... Blah. <laughs> yeah, that's the Goblin King from the Hobbit games. Kind of, yeah. I was like, the great I, I admire people with the ability to sit there and like make just like the grotiest, nasty looking like Nurgle stuff just because it just looking at it makes my skin crawl. But that's like technically a good thing because that means they get, did a good job. <laughs> it, <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> right. Um, you re- do you remember um, a while ago that meme of um, that servitor on the Hellbreck model polishing the sword? Yeah. <laughs> That's amazing. Oh dear. I, I can't show this one on the screen because we'll be demonetized. <laughs> yeah. So instead, show them this picture of someone converting a Mephiston to look like he does on the cover of the uh, second Mephiston series book, which is oh, it's the Necron one. I've completely forgotten its name. What's it called? What's it called? Not City of Light, the one before that. Revenant Crusader? Revenant Crusade, that's it. They did a really good Yeah, they converted job. him to look like that, and it is it's the winner of the open competition, so you like anything goes, and it is so, so good. They did like a really lovely job with like the highlights from the sword, like that kind of like lighting effect. It's really nice. Yeah, object source lighting, I think they call it. It's pretty. Agreed. Also, grot tanks on the throne. Wib will be happy. 
came third in the open competition with Grot Tanks. Wait, now I had to pull that one up. <laughs> I'm actually personally surprised that a single miniature won the Slayer Sword, because normally that award tends to go to things like the winner of the Open competition more than anything. So, Yeah, well, to quote the judges, it says, The painting is literally perfect. <laughs> Immaculate technique and a joy to look at. Like, yeah. No, and what I really like about the skink is the spear. You see how he's got like a glint in the spear, that crystal effect with a with a glint in it. Yeah. Uh, that's what we got. And the tongue. They actually took the time to layer the colours on the tongue. Like it doesn't just a solid single washed colour. It's like multi layers on the tongue. The eyes uh proper reptile eyes as well. It I get what the judges are saying in terms of literally perfect because it's incredible. And you wouldn't know that that stone wasn't actual rocks. I, it looks like mossy rocks, but it probably isn't. You know, I think that it really goes down to the, the um, what do you call it, the little details here. Attention to detail is just, it's like, like, on point. Yeah. Not one little bit is forgotten or neglected with a, at least some, like, extra form of detail on it, so... Yeah, they've see. even put multiple layers on the in fingernails. <laughs> I'm the, I don't even know how you do that with a brush. That's impressive. Just my goodness. <laughs> like with a shit ton of patience, I imagine. Oh gosh, I bet <laughs> you'd have to be there with like uh, a single-haired brush, just like putting on tiny little lines. Oh my gosh. Yeah, if you're gonna win Golden Demon in the Slayer Sword, you've got to do that kind of stuff. I mean, that also shows that it doesn't, it's not always just like the choice of model, but it's like what you do with it and like really bringing the detail of the model to life, even in something like a little skink, I think. I think it's a good, it's a good lesson. Uh, is there anything else in the news? Uh, the only thing that I saw was a, a lore article about the Ash Waste and the Nomads, but I suspect you know all of it already. Uh, I don't think I've seen that article actually. So it sort of suggests that the Ash Waste Nomads may have descended from like the original members of the Araneus continuity who were driven out by the Imperium and sort of... Oh, yeah. Okay, yeah. Um, and that they've bonded with the... Uh, that have been, they've been able to tame these things called Helamites, the bugs. Giant uh, fleas. The giant fleas, indeed. Um, talking about the idea that they have... Um, this idea that superstitious hivers believe they can't be killed they can survive injuries that would kill normal people they take their dead with them um that kind of thing um but no i suspect you know 90 percent, if not all of it already given your general knowledge of necromunda are you telling me that they literally have buggies ha <laughs> oh Didn't. oh that's atrociously <laughs> Good, but also bad, but also good. That's, oh. that's what we call blurst. <laughs> I was just saying, I didn't realise you were a dad scruff. <laughs> Channeling my inner dad. Ba -ba 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 -ba. <laughs> right, so if that's pretty much it for the news, and oh, crikey, look at the team. Uh, <laughs> oh, God. Time to talk more squat. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, <laughs> not, until, not until the dedicated episode where Tactica speaks entirely of an Italian accent. Not happening. If you donate one thousand pounds, <laughs> also not do. happening. We don't know. If you ask them, if you ask them, it might come. You don't know. That. See, see, the ultimate way to get back at both of them is to have me come back, but then try to have a British accent the entire time, and then just hear them cringe. <laughs> Well, we'll have you back while you're doing an English accent, and then we'll try and do American accents. <laughs> Just for some weird uber cringe. Just all, all in all, very confusing. And I can't, and I can't do an American accent to save my bloody life. <laughs> the last time I did an American accent was a very overblown one for a play in year six. So, all the better. Yeah. <laughs> Should have saved that for April Fools. Darn it. <laughs> We can do it for episode 150 if need be. <laughs> did, the entire, did the entire quiz episode or something. <laughs> oh, just... Uh, oh, sorry. Okay, go on. Uh, Sarah Corkwell has confirmed that uh, she's 
part of the writing team for 40k Dark Tide. Don't know if we already knew that, but she tweeted Ooh, that out about half an hour ago. I don't know who that is. Nice. Who is that? Uh, Sarah Corkwell is the author of the Silver Skulls book. She was on the podcast about 10, 15 episodes ago. Oh, okay. Oh, nice. She also wrote the uh, Valkyrie of the Bloody Novels for Warhammer Fantasy as well. That too. Always good to hear people moving up in the world. Because um, she's doing it along with um, ADB, isn't she? Uh, yeah. Is it ADB or Dan Abnett writing with them? I can never remember which of the ones I it thought, is. I thought it was ADB. Um, it probably is ADB. I just haven't got it locked in my head because I just don't. I, I uh, imagine it'd be ADB over Abnett considering ADB has more experience writing Grey Knights than Abnett does anyway, and Abnett generally doesn't like writing Space Marines. Oh, fair enough, but it's not a of Space Marine game. I thought it was like a guard game. Oh, I'm thinking of I'm thinking of um, Demon Hunters, aren't I? The uh, Chaos Gate game. Yes, I think you might be. Yeah, ADB's doing the, the, the Chaos Gate game. Yeah, my bad. Whoops, my bad. <laughs> it's fine. <laughs> Too many games coming out. This is when you find out that Nate Crowley's doing Shoe's Blood and Teeth. <laughs> See, this is what you call a good problem, where you are drowning with all of this new information and new stuff. It's like, hooray, it's great. I can't even remember it all. <laughs> Why can't I hold all these games? Or information about all these games. Uh, yeah, it's written by Abnet. I was right. Dark Tide is right. written by Abnet. Right, my bad. Uh, ADB is writing for a game, so I completely understand the mix-up. It's like me earlier with the Hand of Abaddon and the Hand of Midnight. It's completely fine. Hands are related in both. Indeed. So, Rem, read anything? Yes, I've um, managed to read through the Red Gobbo novella, The Gobbo's Revenge, as it's titled. Or the, I just call it The Gobbo's Revenge, be easier to pronounce. I just keep going, that all the time. <laughs> Yeah, but then you're not doing it justice if you don't say it proper orky every time. But I know what you mean. But yes, I read through that Gobbo's Revenge <laughs> in my shitty little accent. <laughs> Are we, I don't think we need spoilers on this. No, it's been out for quite a while. Agreed. Uh, I'd say it was... It's alright. I, I was actually expecting a lot more, to be honest. Eh. I mean, it's not bad, it's just not good either personally but, I feel but what does that mean is it like it wasn't funny it wasn't engaging it wasn't like mediocre just just kind of meh all around yeah pretty much I found ah. um, like glad but, it's there but wouldn't have like I wouldn't mind if it disappeared either kind of yeah like uh, it's like okay I, I, I don't feel offended having read it but at the same time I wouldn't go more way to pick it up again I won't ask you for a play-by-play in that case because unless there's anything particularly interesting you want to go through. I mean, to be honest, the most interesting thing I found out about the book is that the orcs refer to the tower as the Blue Fish Boys. Because the orcs always have to just pick the stereotypical community caricature <laughs> and go with that. I mean, yeah. they're not the brightest. But yeah, there you go. We got confirmation that the tower are, the, the tower are fish. There you go, that's confirmed. <laughs> <laughs> Basically, yeah, whatever the Warhammer community thinks something is, is what the orcs call them. Are they? Are they? Are they calling are us? Are we orcs? the greenskins? Are we? Yeah. <laughs> are we the greenskins? Because <laughs> I mean, chaos marines are the spiky boys, and Eldari are the pointy-eared ones, um, and this, that, the others. Like, just basically pick a stereotype about that species, and the orcs will call them that. And not even in like a malicious sense. They're just like, that's them. That's yeah. Who they is. <laughs> I still remember, like back in like first and second edition law. Like, Space Marines, they were called Beakies, and Squats, they were called Stunties. <laughs> and and Eldari is a word that I can't actually say anymore. Yeah. Uh... Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, well, I mean, 40K's been around for a long time, so times change, I suppose. <laughs> yeah. Just a bit. Yeah. I'm also because it's not a very long book, so I'm also do the play-by-play. Um, yeah, fair enough. So basically, you got a group of grots, um, uh, basically in as part of the entourage of a Big Mac, a Big Mac called Claws, and he's called Claws because he has no hands, and replaced both his hands with power claws because he blew up blew up both of his hands while working on a Knob's custom Mega Blaster, and so he uses the orcs, uh, he uses the grots to act as his fingers to do all the wiring and stuff, and so the grots are literally called Da Fingers, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> And so the orcs are basically doing a boarding operation over an Imperial Navy ship, 
and uh, claws on the fingers have basically this task like, right, we've been tasked to shut down all the ship's big guns so they stop shooting our stuff. Let's get to it. Um, they're making their way towards the guns. Um, basically taking the elevator. They get off the elevator. There's like a bunch of like uh, Imperial Naval troops coming out. There's a big fight that ensues. Claws ends up getting killed because he ends up having a power sword snapped off in his skull. And um, the leader of the gro- of the Grotz, um, one called Fingwit, or Fingit, is it Fingit or Fingwit? I can't remember. I'm just going to call it Fingit. It'd be easier. Um, he basically says, right, uh, we got to do, right, we got to do this job as, and get all this done. And the other Grotz are asking, who the fuck put you in charge? Well, we don't want to do that. I was like, well, let's put it this way. We either do it and risk getting our shit kicked in by the Umis, or we don't do it and have our shit kicked in by, you know, the big boss. Either way, we're going to get shit kicked in, but at least this way, you know, we're not going to get kicked in by the Orcs. And um, if they don't do it, they're still going to risk getting their bleep kicked in by the Umis getting off the ship anyway. Exactly. Um, so, making our way, um, t- trying to get the way towards the big guns, um, you know, they encounter, they lay a couple of traps for some humans, um, and as they're getting closer towards their target, they encounter another orc, a wounded orc, who basically says, right, you lot are coming with me. And the Gross is saying, we have our own mission. And the Gross is like, don't be fucking stupid, you're Gross, you don't have a mission. Now come with me. Um, the other Gross fall in like, as you, you do what an orc tells you. But Fingwit's like, no. Uh, so the orc gets, sorry, started, basically um, gets grumpy with him, starts going up to Fingwit to try and beat the shit out of him. Fingwit runs, you know, runs for his life. Um, darts for a door that ends up locking shut behind him while the orc's shooting at him, and he basically starts going about like, "Oh, I hate the orcs. You know, why can't you know? Why can't the orcs just go away? Why can't you know we be in charge for once?" He, what he's saying is like he's looking. He's basically having this conversation with his own inner monologue. It's like, "Hey, do you remember the legend of the red gobbo?" It's like that's just legends. Like, well, it's not a legend if you become the red gobbo, is it? Oh yeah. <laughs> and as you say that, he's looking into this puddle of blood from like you know, um, battle between some humans and some orcs, and he basically takes the clothing of the, of the, of the dead orcs and starts stitching himself a jacket because he conveniently has you know, a needle and thread in his pocket. Of course, apparently it's because um, Claus didn't want to go see the pain boy, so basically he ever he usually get the gross to stitch up his wounds mid battle. So that's the <laughs> justification. I mean- Fair enough. If it was, was it established prior, or is it just like, oh, by the way, this is why I have it. <laughs> Turns to look yeah, at it camera. Was, it was basically that's the reason. Yeah, that's that's basically why. Yeah, <laughs> it's very it was, it was very Deus Ex Machina. Yeah, um, and he picks up a, a shooter from one of the dead orcs as well. How the hell is he going to carry that thing oh, over his shoulder? <laughs> It wasn't a big shooter, it was just a regular shooter. No, but there's pictures in the 4th edition codex of a grot unable to pick a slugger off the ground. Plot convenience. Plot convenience, indeed. Plot convenience. He, he does, uh, he does um, like, stomach crunches. Don't worry about it. <laughs> <laughs> um, so basically, he tracks down the other grots, because like, I'm going to save my fellow grots from the from orcish oppression. The orc is bullying the grots, uh, so Fingwood jumps on top of a table... And based tr- tries to start to launch into like you know a whole let my people go type speech, but as soon as he opens his mouth, the orc just turns around and just shoots at him. <laughs> because the orcs don't got time for that shit. Fingwit ends up killing the orc with the shooter, with the excuse of like orc bullets are meant to be you know they're designed to kill things as tough as an orc, so you know it's going to kill an orc kind of thing. All right, fine. I mean, good luck not. Dying to the recoil, but sure, hand wave oh, no. him. Oh no, he was fine with the recoil. He, 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 even though he was knocked back, he was like being pushed back by the recoil. But it seems very convenient, indeed. <laughs> and so the other gross decide to um, follow him after that, and it's like, oh, you really are the red gobbo. It's like, but the red gobbo Smith, I am the red gobbo, and he has a committee. You want to be my committee? All right then. <laughs> so they decide, right, uh, we're going to go and uh, nick the ship now, so we need to go to the bridge. They commandeer the bridge. What? They kill the humans on the bridge except for the servitors and their consuls. What? Yeah. And then they turn the ship's guns on some of the human ship, or some of the Imperial ships, and then it's like, oh, we need to save the rest of the grots. Like, yeah, well, we can't really do that, so we need to go back. Uh, otherwise, we're going to shit kick, shit kicked in. 
And then it ends with like an epilogue saying, I was like, oh, by the way, the Red Gobbo is more than just myth. He could be you, the end. And I'm just thinking, what? that's it. <laughs> yeah, there's a lot of... I, I understand orcs work by the power of plot convenience, but there's a lot too much plot convenience there. Oh, one thing it did establish, they established that these, the reason why Thing was himself so, quote-unquote, tech-savvy is because he watched the mech boy, you know, doing his stuff, and instead of being born with the innate ability, he actually learned how to do stuff. But it does mention how some Grots do actually have the innate ability of mech boys and stuff as well. It's just very, very rare, but some do. I mean, that makes sense. I mean, the brain boys... The evolution of a spore into an orc, a grot, or a snotling, or a fungus is basically depends on location, pot luck, population of the existing region. So if a spore is embedded with the genetic know-whats of how to do a job, it stands to reason that one of them could evolve to be a grot. It's just kind of, I think it's silly though. Like, like one of these things makes sense, but if you start lining all of it together, you're like, that's silly. <laughs> I don't know. Oh, have you heard how, uh, how orc belief worked on Makari the grot? Have you heard that one? Didn't he believe... No, I don't remember. Oh, the, so, the resurrection, yeah. Oh, wait, 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 yeah, is so, that the uh, one where he believed, like, oh, if you put my head back on, I'll just be alive? That was Gazkill himself. Oh. Um, but no, Makari, basically, Makari was, was, is, Gazkill's flag wave of Um And Makari has died an unknown number of times. And every time, Gazkill just points at a new grot and says, that's Makari. <laughs> and that new grot becomes Makari and remembers all the stuff of the original Makaris, too. Oh. I guess because yeah, like when orcs because believe orcs. something, they just like it just becomes reality, I suppose. But do exactly but, that. But do grots have that power? Apparently so. <laughs> I mean, like if they it, say like if all the grots believe one thing, but the orcs believe something else, would do the orcs supersede or are they even? I mean, if you consider like uh, I'm, I'm 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 spitballing now. But the idea of like what energy being generated by all the various green stains, orcs, most dominant species in the in the race, contribute most to the war field. Therefore, if the war field introduces the power of belief in this ability, that if it's something is said to be true, it is true, then what the orcs believe becomes the overriding dogma of what everybody else believes, and therefore the grot is more inclined to believe it. I guess. So that I am just throwing shit into the wind and seeing what sticks, but I mean, yeah, we're basically just trying to make something that makes sense in a book that just seems to be a, just like a basic story about like we're fighting against the oppressors. But I'm like, I don't. The stories are fine. It's just kind of weird to have it for like orcs. I just there's so many other species you could have that with in 40k. Orcs are like kind of weird to do that with. Yeah, uh, the bit that shocks me the most is how on earth did they have enough grots to actually aim and fire the guns on an imperial ship and fly the thing because oh you... basically like uh, they're just messing around with the buttons it's like oh what's this button do bang <laughs> boom pew pew yeah but a lot of imperial guns are hand i mean if you believe everything that said in wolf time imperial guns are hand loaded they're not servitor loaded or some are but some aren't i mean i mean lance batteries are energy weapons True. I mean, yeah, but like um, auto gun, not auto guns. Uh, a lot of the macro cannons and things like that are hand loaded. They have a gunnery crew for each gun. Uh, if you believe what was said in War- Wolf Time about that Imperial ship, which was taken over by orcs as it happened, uh, they had a gunnery crew for each gun, and it was all hand loaded, or at the very least, auto loaded with human input. So you couldn't do it entirely automatically. Well, I guess that's why this book is. It exists. <laughs> it exists. It's there, it's inoffensive, and it's there. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Um, as, as far as orc related stories go, it's... I mean, don't get me wrong, I'm glad that we actually have, you know, a grot-focused story, but at the same time, it's just not a very good one, I feel. Yeah. Uh, especially when you consider the quality of other orc books, things like the Gazkull novel and... The Mike Brooks books and well, things well, like that. Oh, this was Mike Brooks. Oh, this was Mike Brooks. Uh, the other Mike Brooks books. <laughs> yeah. Uh, um, generally, the orc literature that we have had over the past few years has been of a very, very high quality. Or at the very least, it's been funny. Yeah, this one just seems very... There. I don't, I don't, I don't know. I mean, it, it feels like it was like whacked out in an afternoon kind of thing. <laughs> 
Well, I mean, yeah, not everything's I... going to be a banger from a from an author, so. I mean, yeah, and no author bats a thousand. I mean, it's not a personal attack on the author by any means. Yeah. Or anything like that. No, 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 no. We're not saying, oh, Mike Brooks bad. Don't buy Mike Brooks yeah. stuff. It's just a case of this book wasn't as of higher quality as the exceptional books that Mike Brooks has produced on the same subject matter. I mean, again, like, every author has good books and every author has shit books. Like, if you look, like, take Nick, Nick Cohen, for example. Like, I loved Old Earth. I love that book. But Damnos, I thought, was one of the worst books I've ever fucking read. Yeah, and take Guy Haley. I I like a lot of his work, but Dawn of Fire, Avenging Sun, is a confusing mess that I can't It's convoluted follow. is what it is. Yeah, and Gav Thorpe, the, a lot of Gav's work is amazing, and then you get Descent of Angels. No, he didn't do Descent of Angels. Did he not? I, d- no. I sort of thought it was the authority on all things Dark Angels. Yeah, he didn't do Descent of Angels, though. That would be why, then. His worst Fair book enough. was when he never oh, wrote. Was it no, <laughs> hang on, I'm thinking, of, I'm thinking of Wild Rider as Gav's really confusing book, with Necron Tyr and Eldari fighting Slaanesh. Yeah, that was a, we- that was a weird one. Yeah. It's a shame that's that's the last book of the uh, Inari series we're getting though, because like it didn't sell well enough to justify a third one. Yeah, unfortunately, probably because of people like us shit talking it on the internet. I, I I don't think we have that much of an influence. <laughs> no, not us personally, us. But like, if the if there's any a view on the internet about a book or a product, then it does impact the sale of that product. Well, in some way, shape, or form, then, you would think. Then they anyway. better make sure it's a good product. <laughs> I mean, yes, absolutely, but yeah, publishing is hard. I can imagine, and being a writer is hard. So we're not trying to knock these people; they're incredibly good at what they do. Mm-hmm. But we all have favorites, and we all have least favorites. It's natural. And then you get some authors who just do weird shit. Not I'm naming not names. To- I'm not naming names, but you all know who I'm talking about. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Got it now. Moving on. Yeah. <laughs> moving on. <laughs> yeah. I mean, moving I mean, on who, I mean, who knows? It could be my next movie, but hey. Don't. <laughs> <laughs> oh, dear. Shall we do some questions? Oh, that, spe- speaking of which, that reminds me um, about that um, excerpt about the Imperial Fist initiation rituals. Oh, no. What? Yeah, um, yeah. Um, in in old law, um, new recruits to the Imperial Fist would literally eat poop. Why though? What does that do? Because old Ian war Watson. Hammer, that's why. <laughs> <laughs> old Warhammer. Old Hammer was weird. Very but yeah, weird. literally go to the recluse here. I was like, "What do we do here? Here are some poop marbles. You have to eat them, and to prove that your GI <laughs> tract is not uh." It's like, Wanting. No one will ever speak of what happened here, but they felt intimately connected and digested by it. Exact <sighs> words. Oh, pain. What? Pain. <laughs> I'll I'll just say this. Something something. Um. Actually, no. That's too disgusting. Even <laughs> saying I won't go into that. No, I'm just too disgusting. Good. Right. Shall we do some questions then? Yes. Before we derail into further madness, I would recommend it. <laughs> Agreed. Right. I mean, it's not as bad as some of stuff. As far as Watson's concerned, that's tame. <laughs> which, which, is sho- which is shocking. That's what's considered tame. <laughs> <sighs> right, yes. So, we'll start with some squat questions, since, you know, we opened the show, we'll open the questions the same way. How much can you squat? Never tried. So... Now that the squats are back, what piece of new lore are you hoping to learn the most about them? Where the fuck they've been? <laughs> I, I, want, I want to know if they're considered a delicacy to Tyranids. I don't think Nids have delicacies. They just, like, they're, they're like Rem's dog, just a hoover <laughs> of everything biological in their way. <laughs> I, I, will, I will make jokes about the Tyranids eating all of the squats and no one can stop me. <laughs> If they eat squats, does that mean they have a taste for short rib? Oh. <laughs> da, 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 da. <laughs> oh that's terrible. How many jokes have we made about squats being eaten? I think about three now. Four? <laughs> three or four, yeah. Yeah, certainly not a small portion. Hey! Yeah. There we go, got it on the act. <laughs> and speaking of squats and food, how long do you think it'll be until people realise that their models are vaguely egg-shaped and egg-coloured? 
egg colored? Egg? I don't. I don't know. I'm just reading the question. <laughs> what is egg? I'm guessing like pale color, roundish, like bits of white, and uh, maybe they, they prefer their egg, like they have white eggs rather than the pink eggs we typically have here. Like- Pink. Uh, what wait, eggs you are pink you eggs? Not pink. You know what I mean? Like sort of like, like not. You, 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 you brown. brown. Like, like, yes, brown. All right, pinky brown. All right, fine. Shut up. <laughs> I think the cat the term is more for okra. Are you, pre- are you preparing for yes, Easter? Now, are now you you're just, I just, Yeah. All right. Fine. All right. Yes. I don't. I forgot what egg color eggs were. Get over it. <laughs> I forgot what color an egg was. Get over yourself. <sighs> I mean, this is not a Kinder Surprise egg. Oh, yeah, that's... Like the ones that... those Imperial Fists were eating. Don't. <laughs> you brought it back all the way around. That's what the show's all about. Re- <laughs> cyclical references. <laughs> yeah. So, let's do uh, this one. Were the personalities of the Necron tier that became Necron warriors truly erased or just limited? Because in Twice Dead King, Altix ponders whether Necron warriors are mindless or do they have any sense of understanding? From what I recall, it's only the highest ranking ones, the higher ranking ones, like officers and stuff, that actually retain any semblance of their personality and stuff like that. Whereas like lower ranking ones like line troops is just a more or less automata. Yeah, the Necron Immortals, I remember, were hard-coded with a sense of loyalty into them, but that loyalty is not a personality trait. Or it is, but not in this sense. It wasn't, oh, these were the loyal ones, so we're going to make them the Immortals. No, it's like, these are my elite guards, so they became Immortals, and we're going to hard-code them with loyalty. Um, I remember reading a snippet about 5th edition Necron Warriors, saying that, like, when they, like, not speak... But it, a lot of it sounds like when they do like, make a noise, it sounds like screaming, almost like harking to the idea of they realize what they are and they're screaming in their shells, but it's never been enunciated on further. Maybe it's like a lobster where they're not really screaming, but it's their se- like shell having air escaping while they're being boiled. Yeah, it probably is. Which, I mean, honestly doesn't sound any better than screaming. <laughs> but... <laughs> You know, potato, potato, I suppose. <laughs> Aye. In 40k, even the potatoes would be screaming. If I were in 40k, I too dark. would scream. Everything screams. You scream, I scream, we all scream for ice cream. Boom. Okay. And since the next thing we talked about after squats was heresy, we'll go there next. Uh, do you think a Horus Heresy TV series would be a good idea or would it fall flat? I know we've talked about this idea before, but, you know, questions there. May as well answer it. I feel like there's too many It'll books. probably fall flat. There's just too much to cover. And, like, not all It'd of the books are good. It'd be too expensive as well. It'd be too expensive as well. Just because we're, like, trying to get everyone in fucking... Unless you do it like an animated TV series. You know, yeah. Animation is still pretty so expensive. so many extras. It'd be cheaper to do animation than it would be to do like live action with like, you know, practical effects and stuff like that. Like trying to get someone in like an actual practical looking suit of power armor, and you need to do practical effects to have someone in power armor or whatever. Because you know what happened last time when you had some a live action actor with a digitized suit, Green Lantern, I'm... with a green bacon suit. <laughs> I mean, technically, like the the Halo show that's out now. I don't think story wise did too great, but I mean they still did the. the oh, the Halo, the Halo TV series, the, the Halo TV series. The creators literally turned around and said, "Oh, we don't know nothing about the games, and we didn't follow the story, and that's why we have a human lead in the Covenant." Yeah. Oops. I mean, I'm not surprised with how people tend to adapt things and not really pay attention. But my only point was that I mean, technically, Spartan armor is kind of like power armor, and I think they did a good job visually with it, at least, even though he's, I think he's a little too short. Because I thought, I thought they were supposed to be like enormous. The funny thing is, the creators of the Halo TV series like know nothing about the games, and it got shit on. <laughs> and in the Sonic Two movie, they embraced the games, and everyone seems to love that fucking movie. Yeah, what a shock when you actually like adapt something with love and care. People like it, <gasps> and stick true to the source material as well. I haven't seen I mean, it yet. That's what it's there for. It's it. called source material, not a source of your own amusement material. That's a bad joke. 
But that was a bad joke. I mean, yeah, even by sorry. my standards. Yeah, even by your standards, that was a bad <laughs> yeah. joke. Right. Um, this is interesting. Who mandated that the Imperium must use Gothic architecture? Was it the Emperor? According to this commenter, strikes the commenter as more of a Baroque type of a person. Or did the Mechanicum have a Forge Master General who just said, let's put flying buttresses on our spaceships and it just became tradition from there? I think it was actually might have been the Ecclesiarchy because from what I recall, like when Gilliman came out, when he was brought back to life in the present day, he was shocked about how how gothic everything looked. He was like, why the fuck is everything like this? Because it looks cool, but, duh. But by the same token, a lot of Imperial ships haven't changed in design since... Then I saw them are from the same time period. That the Emperor class battleships of today are the same Emperor class battleships of back then. Yeah, but like um, a lot of the ships from back then are used by the forces of chaos today, and they're not used by the Imperium. This is true. So basically, like a ch- that's like a change in design. Um, point taken. Yeah, I mean the Ecclesiarchy makes a lot of sense because they basically ran the Imperium after the Emperor. If you like. Pretty much. Okay. I mean, whoever made that decision made the right decision because Gothic architecture looks amazing. So, I don't know. <laughs> oh, speaking of ships. Um, you know, there was that um, was that World of Battleships or whatever it is. You know, that naval war game, whatever it is. Do you see they did the, the 40k DLC? And yeah, it literally had like a modern day, like naval bow but picked up in like chaos paint job and stuff what oh Jesus that looks so silly I love it oh Jesus <laughs> like I remember seeing that this game had a 40k DLC but I didn't realise it was this derpy yeah you had Imperial Navy and you had word bearers you see the Imperial ship doesn't actually look terrible but aside from the giant eagle brow the Eagle Prow's fine. It's the statue that I think looks a bit off. It's more like they just the kind of tacked one it on there. I think like I would have moved it. Like there's like a little section where there's like a little circle, and I would have just put the statue on top of that pillar instead. That's the chimney. That's a chimney, isn't it? Oh, you don't need a chimney. It's fine. <laughs> <laughs> Not in the Imperium, you don't. <laughs> I would have just made it. Everyone's gonna suffocate. It's fine. <laughs> I, would, I mean, I would just. Uh, oh God. I've, 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 there, was, there was another one. There was a fucking Black Templar one. Oh, God. I promise he just made it too, like, normal ship shaped. Like, just make it blocky and it would probably look a little more 40k ish. You gotta you got love the fucking massive banner. It looks like a fucking advert you'd see on the London Underground saying, Death is our duty. <laughs> also, the Chaos one has a warp portal where the statue is. Just in case you didn't realize how awful it already was. I mean, it's, it's when, just... the Black, when the Black Templar one is more subdued. <laughs> I was just saying, like, it's, like, tacked on. Like, they didn't even try to, like, blend it in with some gold or anything. They're just like, oh, yep, copy-paste. There we go. We're good. It's fine. <laughs> yeah. Oh, dear. It's funny that the official trailer says blood for the blood cause. Like, I'm, I'm pretty sure that's word bearer ship as undivided rather than world eaters. Yeah, that's uh, yeah, that's not a corn H. Yeah. Red, red is corn, obviously, duh. I mean, yeah, I guess, but it's the. <laughs> oh no, it, it could be corn because it looks like he's got the world. Careful, it's got the worldy design icon on his belly. Yeah, and he's got a cornate symbol like tucked into his shoulder pad. I thought it was word bearers at first. Uh, it's because that that skull helm, I think, in the in the chest plate really reminds you of the word bearers chapter symbol a bit. Mm. Yeah, that it does. Oh, it does to me it. anyway. And they have red armor as well, so. I think... And red armor. Well, it's because they're both red. That's kind of the. Remember when the world eaters were blue and white. But then, no. then they'd be mistaken for uh, ultramarines. Mm. It's just, it's just your standard ultramarines were just um, cutting people up, people's heads off, and drinking their blood. You know, oh, don't worry, it happened with the with the carmine blades. Remember? Oh, what do you mean they got reclassified as the Blood Angels chapter? Whoops. <laughs> <laughs> uh oh. Oops. Also, fun fact: that actually did happen in law. The, the carmine blades were originally listed as an ultramarine successor chapter, and no one could figure out why are we getting visions of Sanguinius. <laughs> Then Astaroth then Astaroth turns around and says, Oh, by the way, your blood interest successors. Oh we oh okay, that explains everything actually. <laughs> thanks for the thanks for the late heads up. That's more like a You could have told us about five hundred years ago, but hey. <laughs> there are any more questions? There are, yes. Sorry, I'm just trying to read through this one. Well, there's two in a question. I'm trying to read the second one and it's just Yeah, no. Okay. 
how would you rebalance blanks to make them a bit more fair? Because a powerful enough psych can just lol nope a psych a blank away. Like Magnus can just walk over the sister of silence like it's nothing. So I, f- I feel like would you think it- Magnus is special though? Oh, sorry, I, I think I, mm. I didn't let you finish. No, no, you're right. You're absolutely right. Magnus is a unique case, but there are enough. For example, on the tabletop, sisters of silence. Do not shut down psychers. They make it a little bit more dangerous to be a psyker, but they, I don't even think they have an effect on your, like, casting role. I think they just make it more dangerous if you go for it. Um, so do we need, in a law or a gaming sense, do we need to buff up blanks and make them more powerful? Or did it just become an I win button for the Imperium? If not, it's a bit difficult to balance that one. I mean, I understand why you don't do it for tabletop because you need to keep things balanced. But in law, like, for example, if an Aversa assassin... No, hang on, not Aversa. Calexus. Calexus, thank you. Um, a Calexus assassin goes up to a Psyker. That Psyker cannot do... and should not be able to do anything about it. And but, should just be in complete pain just by being near him. Exactly. Um, whereas, like, the Silent Sisterhood don't seem that... Like, it's uncomfortable to be a Psyker around them, but you can still do your Psychic stuff to an extent. Um, and it's not like the sister's going to say, oh no, you guys are fine. You carry on doing what you're doing. But it's more painful to be a psycho around a sister of silence. Absolutely. But it's not impossible, which maybe it, you know, should be, at least in law. Oh, that reminds me of like a pretty awesome thing that the sister of silence did um, in the War of the Beast, which actually ended the war, essentially. Because they basically had a, they captured a weird boy. And they were basically like holding him by chains, whatever. And they were basically escorting it into like the beast's throne room, where you know the, the orcs were fighting, you know, the space and all that. Mm-hmm. And one by one, the sister of silence ended up dying. And when the last one died, the weird boy was able to connect or you know, start using psychic powers again. But because he was right in the middle of a big punch up, he absorbed too much psychic energy too quickly, and then. His head exploded, and the psychic feedback caused all the orcs within like a ten mile radius to explode. Yeah, didn't they also do some sort of reverse war field, or is that the same thing? I think that yeah, it, was, it was basically it. Yeah, I don't think that's yeah. a reverse war. When when that just make them go, oh, I don't really feel like fighting. Not like literally explode. <laughs> it's like wow, it's more like a ow, splat. Ew. Yeah, I'm not even going to try and digest that second half of the question because it, it it's like how would you rewrite the tale to make them like you would if you did a big like the neck retcon? How would you rewrite the tale? And they basically just describe how the tale have been rewritten <laughs> and what the tale's law is, and say I would make them do this instead of something that they're clearly not. So yeah, I'm just going to leave that alone. We would rehash the Horus Heresy with Farsight as Horus. Do, 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 Who called do, do, the Taurus Heresy? And speaking of Tau, this is a question I feel like we've been asked like six, seven times, but, well, all right. Can you see a legitimate attempt for peace or an alliance between the Imperium and the Tau? No. And do you think the Tau would take it? Following the events of Damocles, probably not. I more just wouldn't see the Imperium doing it. The whole point is that they hate literally everything else because everything else is trying to kill them, and then it just feeds into that. <laughs> Yeah. I mean, this first one, the, the only reason why they tolerated, like, leaving the Scots independent is like, well, they're human, so we can let it slide, but blue fish people, no. And blue fish people that have taken and mind controlled all of our soldiers, no. So I know that's not what they actually do, but that's probably how the Imperium sees it. Again, Scots going to go away with what they did because of the virtue of them being human. Not that that saved everybody. Hi, Interrex. No, but the Interrex were also working with aliens, though, weren't they? It was, a, it was it was a mixed it was a mixed species society of both humans and aliens. Good point. Good point. And even then, that was all Erebus's fault anyway. So, yeah, Erebus did everything wrong. He did, just like Magnus did. Oi! How could you? You know I'm right. How could you go against the meme? No, I'm kidding. I agree, Magnus. It's kind Magnus of. Magnus but... did everything wrong, but for the right reasons it, and by accident. I mean, that's the it, the meaning of like a. Uh, how what the road, the road to hell was paved? Yeah, paved with good intent. Yeah, <laughs> pretty much. And speaking of chaos and hell, has it been stated anywhere that the realm of chaos extends past galactic borders? Uh, considering we don't really have any experience of 
anything going beyond the galactic border itself, apart from orcs, because orcs are fucking everywhere. Um, it's like mold. I don't think it's actually been mentioned. So, and considering that the realm of chaos is an alternate plane of reality, I imagine it would. But it's also powered by psychic energy of mortal species. If there's nothing there, there's nothing to power it. Yeah, but again, orcs do are known to exist outside the galaxy. True, because they because they found a probe that went out into like the Andromeda galaxy, and went and I came back, um, went out of the Milky Way into Andromeda and came back, and then when they found the recording, it was just like, oh, the recording is just orcs. Of course, because fucking orcs. Of course they are. Yeah, basically, we we can have. We can have our spin-off series, you know, uh, Warhammer 3000 Andromeda. <laughs> yeah, hopefully it would go better than the Mass Effect one did. I mean, that's kind of a low bar. I feel like just doing okay would still... <laughs> the thing is, I, I don't know if this is controversial, but I don't think Mass Effect Andromeda was actually that bad. Oh, says Drac and Vetra were the best things about that game. Oh, Drac and Vetra were awesome, and... They were the best bits about the game, entirely. They're- but like you could have fun ideas, but still be meh. <laughs> yeah, like it was the best vehicle they've had. Sorry, Mako, get in the bin. <laughs> like I get what they were trying to do. I'm not going to say it's the best game ever made because it's not. But oh, was it was it bad? Was it so worthy of derision, especially considering how badly derided Mass Effect Three was? Uh, uh, I think it, people it was thought. So- it was certainly the worst Mass Effect game. If it were, if it didn't have the Mass Effect IP, people would look on it far differently. Because from a gameplay perspective, it was a it was an entertaining and competent shooter. Story wise, though, a bit lacking. Character development, aside from Drac and Vetra, you know, again lacking. If it, if it had a different, if it was if it was a completely different IP, people would probably look onto it quite favorably. It's like yeah, it's actually all right. But the fact yeah. it's Mass Effect, that's what people were upset about. Yeah, it's kind of like if you'd made The Outer Worlds a spiritual successor to Fallout New Vegas' house ending. Like, people go, that's not a Fallout game, Obsidian. This is a competent game that should not be a Fallout game. It's same same idea, I guess, because Outer Worlds is considered a good game with limitations, and I think Andromeda would get the same treatment. But people just jumped on the My Face is Tired and then decided to just mm. look no further and just rip roll it forever. I mean, I mean, in first there was a bad. shit ton of bugs in the, in the game. Oh yeah, it was it was buggy on launch, but the, there are communities that are willing to forgive buggy games. Again, high Fallout New Vegas. Yeah, but Fallout New or Vegas, Stalker. not even the. It's a much better <laughs> game, objectively speaking. <laughs> oh yeah, absolutely. Fallout New Vegas is like one of the best games ever made, and my favorite game of all. But... It, was, it was it was better than Fallout Three, even though it was based on the same engine. Yeah, like I said, my personal favorite game of all time. Good choice, I think. I mean, so I, so I try. I started playing through Andromeda, and even I, like, it's like 2022, and we still got fucking horrendous glitches in it. Like just walking, like just walking along, all of a sudden you just fall through the fucking floor. I was like, what the? Into the skybox. <laughs> it's like, pretty sure that's not meant to happen. <sighs> just, but hey, at least we got Drac and Vetra, and they're the best things about it. So <laughs> they're the only reason to play the game. That we did get the trailer for like a four for like Mass Effect Four. It was like a teaser kind of thing, like, oh, we're working on it. You're like, okay, yeah. I guess. <laughs> that's cool. I, guess. I mean, it showed Liara at least, so it's like, hey, we're getting a Liara back. Hey, that's something. Yay. We're getting a beloved character. <laughs> Probably the only one we're going to get, <laughs> but still, it's better than no one. Any more questions? Uh, do, 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 do. I don't know. I don't speak do do do. Not helpful. Done that one. There was one that I saw that was well, war for you. Have you watched Death Note and does your character have one? Do you mean the anime or the or the shitty Netflix adaptation? <laughs> we don't. I don't know. It just says Death Note. We don't talk about the Netflix adaptation. <laughs> the anime, yes, I've, I've watched both. But I'll, just, I'll, I'll assume you mean um, the anime. That's what you say. Yes, and it should have ended when L died, and they should not have bothered with the Hope and Mellow story because that was shit. <laughs> and no, I don't have one. I mean, yeah. I kind of agree because then they just kind of were trying to fill the void with two characters that it's like I think Hope, it, Hope and Mello were you were fucking atrocious characters. I feel like if they're given enough time, maybe they could have like developed and been interesting. But it was just kind of like it felt like almost the tail end. They're like, "Here's the characters," and then run, 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 run. Oh, okay, the story's in. Bye. It, it was it was literally like, "Oh, by the way, L's dead. Oh, by the way, here are his proteges." It's just like, "Fuck off." <laughs> 
We, we got we got literally like, literally like a mini me version of Elle and some Tosso who's obsessed with chocolate. It's just like, did you say chocolate? No. Chocolate. He'd be more that fish from SpongeBob would be more entertaining than fucking Mellow. <laughs> Definitely far more memorable. There's a question here about the ending to Twice Dead King 2, but I don't really want to just start a mini spoiler section at the end. So it's a good question, and I do quite like it, but I'm going to put a pin in it just for a few weeks until we're out of the spoiler section for that book. Um, You're welcome to go and read it, Rem, if you want to respond to them ahead of time, if you want to do that. Um, And with that, I think I'm out of questions. Unless you've got any that you saw last episode we didn't get to answer that you want to do? I don't recall, to be honest. <laughs> More than fair, it has been two weeks. I have a question. Go on. How many... Oh gosh, I forgot the question! No! It was going to be dumb oh, yeah. anyway. It was the, the woodchuck chuck one, but I, I forgot the beginning. How much wood could a woodchuck chuck if a woodchuck could chuck wood? Yeah. <laughs> How much wood would a woodchuck chuck if a woodchuck could chuck wood? 14.7. What? How much wood could a woodchuck chuck if a woodchuck could chuck wood? 14.7. 14.7 what, though? <laughs> Cubic tons. <laughs> Where did you get this I don't think you have quite a sense of scale of quite how heavy that is, Rem. <laughs> I mean, that's a lot. I don't think you understand the determination of the woodchuck. <laughs> they are determined little creatures. As we can... And they say laws of physics be damned. <laughs> Because they were so pissed off about the fucking Hope and Mellow out from Death Note that they're just like, ah, I'm going to cut all this wood and chuck it all up. <laughs> and then they get some beef chuck for some chuck steak. And they'll just chuck it at someone because they're the wood chuck. And they chuck the chuck. For context, 14.7 tons is 15,000 kilograms. Exactly. They'll chuck the chuck at chuck. Because fuck chuck. <laughs> <laughs> And on that note, ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much to everyone who joined in to listen to this episode. We apologise for that. And <laughs> thank you very much to Scruffers, a.k.a. Adeptus Alamaris, for joining us this episode. I apologise for nothing. <laughs> <laughs> Links in the and, description below, of course. So, until next time, this has been Runways from 40k Theories. This has been Tactica Imperialis. Am I supposed to say something here? Yes. <laughs> oh. That'll do. <laughs> <laughs> well, I did. And we'll see you again next time. Bye-bye.